Have you ever, uh, you ever been shopping and you think to yourself, who's buying this? Have you ever had that thought? You look at a product and you're like, certainly no one's actually. Here's just a couple that I found with a quick Google search. How about uh, Cheetos lip balm? <laughs> who's buying this? Like who's thinking, okay. <laughs> we have counseling available in the lobby afterwards. That's, can you imagine accidentally grabbing like the flaming hot version? That, that'll ruin a. <laughs> That'll ruin a Tuesday. How about, how about this one here? Uh, bacon strip bandages. Does anyone wonder if the prize inside is just bacon? Like, wouldn't that be, wouldn't that be fun? This one, I, I promise you, this is a real product. I'll end with this one here. This is a cat groomer. This is a cat tongue that you put in your mouth as you groom your cat. On the count of three, who's buying this? One, two, three. Who's buying this, right? Who's, it's such an odd, now some of those are like really, really obvious, right? Like we look at products like that, we think, okay, that's insane. Who's buying this? But there's a lot of consumption in our modern era that is not nearly as obvious. Experts claims that, claim that we see on average 4,000 ads per day. Every single one of those with the sole focus of stirring our discontentment. The trouble is this, that we are finite, but our desire is infinite. Thomas Aquinas, who was a philosopher and priest from the 13th century, was once asked this question. What would it take to satisfy human desire? And his answer was haunting. His answer was everything. What does it take to satisfy this insatiable appetite for more? By and large, we are rarely satisfied. The US is arguably the only advanced country with no national vacation policy. We work, 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 work Rihanna style and we leave vacation days <laughs> unused. <laughs> and we leave those days unused to work more, to buy more, to get more, to acquire more. And as a result, the storage industry in the United States is a whopping 300 or $38 million a year industry in the US alone. It's like the writer of Ecclesiastes knew all along when they wrote Ecclesiastes 5, whoever loves money never has enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with their income. And so today we're talking about our stuff. We're actually in a four-part series about generosity. What does biblical New Testament generosity look like? And I today I want to talk about this insatiable appetite for more. Now there's a guide. We've partnered with a ministry called Practicing the Way. You can go to bridge.tv slash practices. There's a whole guide there with resources and podcasts and discussion questions. But it's worth noting, and I mentioned this last week, that there are over 2,000 passages in the Bible about wealth and resources. Jesus himself spends almost 25% of his earthly ministry talking about wealth and resources and money. 16 of his 38 parables deal with money, and there is more in the New Testament about money than heaven and hell combined. So Jesus seems to think that what we do here on earth with our resources, with our wealth, with our time, with whatever it is that we've been entrusted with, actually has deep spiritual significance. Martin Luther put it this way. He said there are three conversions, the conversion of the heart, the conversion of the mind, and the conversion of the purse. My guess is that many of us, perhaps if you consider yourself a Christ follower, maybe you've been convinced in your mind, or you've been moved emotionally, you've been convinced in your soul, in your heart. But Luther and others before him would say, often it is the last thing to be converted is what we do with our stuff. This is why we begin with this open-handed posture every week as a reminder that it's all God's to begin with. I think generosity is one of the most beautiful declarations that we belong to a different kingdom and follow a different king. Now we have to remember that at the center of the Christian story, we see Jesus who became poor, emptied himself, was obedient all the way to a cross so that we might live. That's the center of the story. And whether or not you grew up in church at all or not, you probably know this, 1 John three sixteen: God so loved the world that he, it's actually at the center of God's nature to be a giver, to be, generous and we are made in the image and likeness of a God who is generous. I would say it this way, that generosity is our family trait. We were made in the image and likeness of a God who by his very nature is generous and we are made in the image and likeness of that God. But humans have long believed that the answer is more. Psychologists call this the hedonic treadmill 
It means the desire leads to more desire. It's like a treadmill. You're always walking, never getting there. It's like chasing the carrot on the stick, the hedonic treadmill, the belief that if I just got a little bit more, then I would be satisfied. Then I'd be at peace. Then I'd feel fulfilled. It's what makes statements like this so jarring from Jim Carrey. He says, I think everybody should get rich and famous and do everything they ever dreamed of so they could see that it's not the answer. This is someone who climbed the height of every possible mountain any of us could ever aim at. And he got there and said, oh, I'm still me. There's still this gaping hole. It didn't actually deliver the way that I thought it would. It makes it even into our spiritual language. We see this in the church all the time. Whenever we get more money or more square footage or some kind of accumulation, we tend to sort of bogart the word blessed, right? And we say, oh, I'm hashtag blessed. It is worth noting, the New Testament uses the word blessed 112 times, not once is it connected to material wealth. Is it possible that we have gotten wrong what the blessed life actually is and what it looks like? And not only does more not make us happy, it often makes us less happy. We are the most affluent nation in the world, yet also, by most metrics, the unhappiest. This is why most of Jesus' teachings on money is not about how to get more of it, but the dangers of it. Here's one situation in the Gospel of Luke. Luke 12. So someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Now, we're not given any, any background here, but it was obvious that they were involved in some kind of legal dispute over the estate that their father had left them, which was not that uncommon in the first century. But I want you to notice the tone. Not Jesus, could you help? Jesus, would you mind? He says, do this. He demands it of Jesus, which I would just, this is a freebie. If you're in a position where you're demanding stuff from Jesus, you might wanna hit pause for a second. Jesus, do this for me. Jesus replied, verse 14, man, who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you? I like to imagine this is like surfer Jesus. He's just like, man, <laughs> why do you? That's not, that's not accurate, by the way. That's not. But he's saying, why do you involve me in this? Now, Jesus is not indifferent to injustice, quite the opposite. But I would say this. I think this is really important for us in framing this conversation around generosity. Sometimes the most loving thing Jesus can do is derail what we're demanding of him. Sometimes the most loving thing is not actually giving us everything that we want all the time. Any parents in the room, you know this to be true. Sometimes the most loving thing is saying no, is derailing what we are demanding of him. Jesus is not a mascot. He is... Messiah, he's not here to fulfill our agenda and answer to our demands. And then verse 15, then he said to them. Now this is really important because you know there's a guy in the crowd that shouts out, Jesus responds to the guy, and then here there's a turn. Now he's speaking to all of them. He's talking to everybody. He's gonna issue a warning, not just to this one guy, but to all of us. Then he said to them, watch out, Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Jesus is such a brilliant teacher. Apparently, justice is not the issue here. It's greed. Sometimes greed can masquerade as something good, but as Jesus often does, he gets right to the heart of the matter. In fact, one commentator defines the Greek word translated greed as, quote, the insatiable lust for more. Greed is like lust, but for things for more, this hedonic treadmill. I would say it this way, that love and lust are opposites. If love is patient, lust is always in a hurry. It's always searching for how can I get more, acquire more, have more, and apparently according to Jesus, lucky for us, there are all kinds of greed. He doesn't just simply say be on guard against greed. That would be tough enough as it is, but all kinds of greed, which means for us, not all greed looks the same. The kind that you think you're doing well to avoid is just one of the kinds. In the Greek, this warning to be on guard is in what's called the present imperative, which means Jesus is imploring us to stay in a state of constant vigilance against all kinds of greed. He's saying, do not let your guard down here. It's insatiable. It's everywhere. The threat of greed is constant. What he will tell us later is that life, abundant life, is not found in stuff that we can acquire. But advertising is a multi-billion dollar industry, and I think we would all agree that executives would not spend that kind of money if it didn't work. Don't don't you wish that advertisers would be honest about that? 
I found, I found some ads that uh, they're called honest ads. And this is what advertisers would say if they were honest. Here's one of my favorites. Lego, the bane of your foot's existence. <laughs> Just call it what it is, right? Or how about, how about this next one here? McDonald's, because you only have $4. <laughs> No judgment. We've all been there, right? I was there a couple days ago. All right, how about, how about Subway? Let that bread smell soak into your clothes. If you've been to Subway, we all know. We can smell it. It's, it's true. How about Gillette? We're just going to keep adding more blades. <laughs> Have you seen this? Some of them, it's like this big now. Like who's, I don't know who's shaving with that one. This one feels close to home for me. Monopoly, a great way to ruin friendships. <laughs> See, anyone found out the hard way? Like, oh, I didn't realize I had a competitive brother-in-law. Okay, guess we can't be friends anymore. How about this one? Maybelline. Maybe it's Photoshop. <laughs> Just be honest. And then lastly, maybe not the most funny, but the most on the nose, Nike. Just buy it. Just buy it. Isn't that really ultimately what all advertising is getting at? Just buy it. Just, just do it. Just pull the... Tr- just by it. This is all amplified now by algorithms designed to excavate our deepest longings, desires, hopes, and fears, and that's what makes accumulation so dangerous. But it's not only dangerous. Look at what Jesus says in Mark chapter four. It says, still others, like seeds sown among thorns, hear the word, but the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desires for other things come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. There are some things that are dangerous, right? And like, obviously so. I don't know, growing up in the 90s, I thought like quicksand would be a much bigger issue than it is. But like, there are things that like, oh, if I see that, I know to avoid it. Jesus says that wealth is not only dangerous, what's the word he uses here? It's deceitful. It promises what it can't deliver. And we fall for it over and over and over again. Jesus again in Matthew 19. Then Jesus said to his disciples, truly I tell you, it's hard for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. Jesus seems to see wealth, first and foremost, not as a hashtag blessed life, but as a hurdle. As like a real obstacle to the life of flourishing that we were designed for. See, the thing about greed for many of us is that we don't see ourselves as greedy, but we all know someone who is, right? Anyone right now, you're like, boy, I wish so-and-so was here to hear the sermon. Anyone already thinking that? (laughs) No, not me. No, that guy, my neighbor, I gotta let him know. Like floating down a lazy river, we often merely adopt the same posture towards money that our culture does. But the practice to disrupt this is generosity, is biblical New Testament generosity. In Luke 11, Jesus says to the religious elite of his day, then the Lord said to him, now then you Pharisees clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside you are full of greed and wickedness. I've never really thought about this before, but wickedness is general, greed is specific. Jesus chose to articulate that one particular vice. And then two verses later, he says, but now as for what is inside you, be generous to the poor and everything will be clean for you. In the mind and imagination of Jesus, the antidote to greed is generosity. If your life feels like this never-ending treadmill or you find yourself plagued with anxiety or an endless appetite for more, contentment can be found in kingdom-minded generosity. Look at 1 Timothy 6. Paul here is both reiterating the words of Jesus but also offering a different path forward. 1 Timothy 6, verse 6. But godliness with contentment is great gain. So apparently a part of great gain in the Apostle Paul's mind is this word contentment, having enough, hopping off of the treadmill. Verse seven, next verse, for we brought nothing into the world and we can take nothing out of it. You've probably heard the saying before, uh, there's a reason that hearses don't come with a trailer hitch, right? Maybe you've seen an image like this. Um, You don't usually pull a U-Haul behind a hearse because you can't take it with you. We instinctually know that this is ridiculous, and yet many of us live our very short lives just trying to have the best toys. He who dies with the most toys still dies. Um, I came across a story that I think illustrates this idea really well. Any, any Stephen King fans here today? Any safe place, that's okay. I, okay, I don't typically associate him with timeless biblical truths. Um, 
But in a commencement speech delivered to Vassar College, he offered some powerful insights. I want to just read part of his speech. He says, a couple of years ago, I found out what you can't take it with you means. I found out while I was lying in a ditch on the side of a country road covered with mud and blood. I had a MasterCard in my wallet, but when you're lying in a ditch with broken glass in your hair, no one accepts MasterCard. We all know that life is ephemeral, but on that particular day in the, in the months that followed, I got a painful but extremely valuable look at life's simple backstage truths. We came in naked and broke. We may be dressed up when we go out, but we're just as broke. Warren Buffett, going out broke. Bill Gates, going out broke. Stephen King, broke. Not a crying dime. All the money you earn, all the stocks you buy, and all the mutual funds you trade, all of that is mostly smoke and mirrors. No matter how large your bank account, no matter how many credit cards you have, sooner or later things will begin to go wrong with the only three things that you have that you can really call your own, your body, your spirit, and your mind. So what I want you to consider, making your life the one long gift to others, and why not? All you have is on loan to you anyway. All that lasts is what you pass on. We all have the power to help, the power to change. Giving is a way of taking the focus off of the money we make and putting it back where it belongs, on the lives we lead and the families we raise and the communities that nurture us. A life of giving repays. It helps us remember that we may be going out broke, but right now we have the power to do great good for others and for ourselves. So I ask you to begin giving and to continue as you began. I think you'll find in the end that you got far more than you ever had and did more good than you could ever dream. It's a lot like the words of Jesus. It's more blessed to give than to receive. That's pretty sobering. And at the core, and I hope that you get this, because I know some of us, you hear like, oh, a four-week series on generosity, and we kind of roll our eyes. I hope that you understand this. I believe generosity is something God wants for us, not from us. That when we think that like clinging to more, the white-knuckling, our little pile, our little kingdom, our little whatever, that it's actually not the, the way to life abundantly that he invites us into. And Paul goes on in 1 Timothy 6. He says, but if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. The idea is this, if we have the, bakes, the basics of life, food, clothing, shelter, as long as we have God and each other, that's enough. Verse nine, those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. The word want there literally means uh, long to be, someone to set their hearts on. This is, again, that treadmill language for insatiable appetite. We've set our sights, our bullseye on something that will accomplish what I cannot accomplish on my own. And then verse 10, for the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Now, this is often misquoted. Well, regularly people say money is the root of all evil. Is that what Paul says? No, he says it's the love of money. Money itself is not evil. It can do great good or great harm, but it is not neutral. The love of money is more powerful than we typically realize. Hence what he says next. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. So what is God's solution? The solution, according to Paul here, is contentment. Drawing a line in the sand and saying, enough is enough. It's the opposite of something called the Diderot effect. Have you ever heard of the Diderot effect? This, you can go and impress no one at your next party with this tidbit of information. <laughs> Let me give you a, just a brief overview. The famous French philosopher, Denis Diderot, lived nearly his entire life in poverty, but that all changed in 1765. Diderot was 52 years old and his daughter was about to be married, but he could not afford to provide a dowry. Despite his lack of wealth, Diderot's name was well known because he was the co-founder and writer of one of the most comprehensive encyclopedias of his time. When Catherine the Great, the Empress of Russia, heard of Diderot's financial troubles, she offered to buy his library from him. And suddenly, now, Diderot had money to spare. So after this sale, Diderot acquired a new scarlet robe, and that's when everything went wrong. Diderot's scarlet robe was so beautiful that he immediately noticed how out of place it seemed when surrounded by the rest of his common possessions. The philosopher soon felt the urge to buy some new things to match the beauty of his robe, a new rug, a kitchen table, a mirror, an armchair. These reactive purchases have become known as the Diderot effect. The Diderot effect states that obtaining a new possession often creates a spiral of consumption which leads you to acquire more and more new things. As a result, we end up buying things that our previous selves never needed to feel happy or fulfilled. Anyone found that to be true? You buy one new couch, you're like, well, now we need a new set of chairs. 
these curtains don't match our new lovely living room set now. And what's with these ratty old clothes? It's actually kind of like the adult version of uh, if you give a mouse a cookie. Remember that book? <laughs> you give him a cookie, but he's always going to want more. And the reason books like that resonate is because it's innate in all of us. We understand this, like, what's he call it? This spiral of consumption. It's easy to buy the lie that I'll finally be content when I have this dollar amount or this square footage or this new toy or whatever it is. The truth is this. If we worship Jesus, we can be content. If we worship money, we'll never be. Full stop. If that's the thing that our hearts are after, it is a never-ending treadmill. We can be content and joyful right here and now through biblical generosity. And there are two big ways to do that. Through giving stuff away and through simplifying. Just to get really honest, how much can I give, I think is a great question, but for many of us, we have so little margin as it is, we don't feel like we can give it all. To live generously with our time, our talent, and our treasure, we need this one very important word, and that's margin. Margin with our schedule, margin with our budget, margin with our relationships. In my opinion, for followers of Jesus, people should see how we spend our money and assume we make way less than we do. To create margin to live a posture of generosity. The Apostle Paul says we will be content. This Greek here implies resolution. It's a decision to not give in to greed. There will be a time where we have to draw a line and say enough is enough. Followers of Jesus work both toward generosity and away from greed simultaneously. This is an invitation for all of us. And every generous person that I've ever known personally has imposed some kind of limit. They didn't just like wake up generous one day. It wasn't just like in their blood or in their DNA. They imposed some kind of limit. The problem is, particularly in the United States, many of us think that by rejecting all limits, we remain free. I would argue that actually by barraging ourselves with so many choices, we get so decision fatigued that we're unable to choose anything well. You ever gone to Cheesecake Factory recently? You know what I'm talking about? In that magazine of a menu they hand you, and they're like, oh, can I help you with anything? Like, sorry, I'm only on page 87. I'm gonna need a second still. There's so, it's so many options, so many decisions. It's kind of like this. Um, this is the, uh, the float ball for the back of a toilet, right? <laughs> this is not my best illustration, fair warning. Um, there's a psychologist named Timothy Miller, and he wrote a book called How to Want What You Have. And he says that for most of us in the modern era, we are living like a toilet tank without a float ball. The float ball is there to like indicate, hey, we're full, that's enough. Without the float ball, what happens in the tank? It just spills over. The cup runs us over and not in a jesus kind of way. He says, most of us are living without any kind of limits, without any kind of line in the sand to say, enough is enough and it's all a gift from God. And so how do I live with a kingdom mindset with whatever God has given me? Are we, are we living life without a float ball? No limits, no parameters. Now again, a good place to start Bridge.tv slash practices. I don't have any like one size fits all application for you. For you this week, it might be give something away. Maybe it's sell something and like take that money and like help someone in need. Maybe it's going without. Maybe it's gratitude. Maybe it's leaving here and go and tip like crazy somewhere. Go go and blow a waiter's mind today and just tip with radical kingdom generosity. What if the good life doesn't come from doing whatever we want, but having the ability to do what we were made for? It's not saying no limits. It's not like get rid of the float ball. It's saying, God, what what do you have for me to do with whatever it is that you've entrusted me with? One of the most beautiful verses about contentment, in my opinion, it comes from Hebrews 13. It says, keep your lives free from the love of money and be, what's the word? Content with what you have because God said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. There's freedom right here, right now in Jesus. You can make enough money to retire 10 times and still not actually be free still be enslaved to greed and anxiety. The great philosopher Bob Marley once said, some people are so poor that all they have is money. Seneca, the Stoic philosopher who had firsthand experience with being wealthy said, it is not the man who has too little, but the man who craves more that is poor. And notice the why in Hebrews 13. The why that we can be content is because God never leaves us or forsakes us. 
that if you have freedom in Jesus, you have everything that you need. What we often search for in possessions can only be found in God. Again, Augustine says it this way, you have made us for yourself, O Lord, and our heart is restless until it rests in you. Now, a few verses later in 1 Timothy, Paul offers these words that I'd like to offer as a bit of a challenge and an invitation for us this next week. 1 Timothy 6, verse 17 says, command those who are rich in this present world. Now, again, he's not talking about like Oprah or Mark Zuckerberg rich. Like by most standards, globally, most of us fit into that rich category before we let ourselves off the hook. It says, command them not to be arrogant nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Notice that it suggests that if we have a decent amount of stuff, there's a, there's a tension, there's a draw to put our hope in wealth. So many of us consciously or unconsciously think that the thing that will bring us contentment is more. And I think there are at least three different ways that we misplace our hope in money. Security, satisfaction, and significance. One, we think that money can bring us security. Yet we lie awake wondering, like, will it be enough? If anyone survived the crash of 2008, you know that that is not a good place for us to put our security. Secondly, we misplace our hope when it comes to money and the thought that it will bring us satisfaction. We spend and spend and spend hoping that it will somehow, like, fill this insatiable desire in us. And lastly, we hope that money can bring us significance. Many of us see money and wealth and status as an indicator of how important or successful we actually are. The truth is money can't bring any of those things. In fact, when we put our hope in money, money actually becomes our master. And if you don't hear anything else today, please hear this, that there is a God who loves you and doesn't want you to live like that. He wants to free us from the hold that money and wealth and possessions has over us. This is why he says, don't put your hope in wealth. Put your hope in me, the only place that it won't fail. So what does it look like to put my hope in God instead of money? Here's the key, next verse. Command them to do good. To be rich, not in bank statements and stock options, but in good deeds and to be generous and willing to share. Generosity is the vehicle. Just to say it again, generosity isn't something God wants from you. It's something he wants for you. And if we understand that, if we get that, if we can actually take him at his word that that's actually true, that it is actually more blessed to give than receive, we begin to discover the life that is truly life. Paul goes on to say that when we are generous in this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. We talked last week about laying up treasures, and Paul's just saying, make sure you lay them up in the right place. That by doing so, by living like this with our things, we can begin to take hold of the life that is truly life. Put another another way, it is hard to take hold of the good life if we're busy clinging to ours. It It is hard to take hold of anything when we're living I don't know what that is for you. I don't know what it is that you've been white knuckling or trying to protect or trying to accumulate. That is what God wants for us though, the life that is truly life, to join him in bringing hope and healing to a world so desperately in need of it. When we rely on wealth, something begins to happen to our hope. It migrates. It migrates to accumulation. Paul is saying, don't let your hope migrate. Keep it focused on him. I would say it like this, that we can't satisfy the eternal with the temporal. It's exactly what Aquinas was saying. What would it take to satisfy human desire? By earthly metrics, everything. You can't satisfy the eternal with the temporal. The truth is, I actually think that you can take it with you. That picture of a hearse in U-Haul, I think think you can take it with you. It just depends on what your definition of it is. Possessions don't last. Everything tied to my relationship with God does. And when we understand that, it will fundamentally change the way we live in the world. Because if just a little more, if that will never lead to happiness or safety or satisfaction, if true rest and contentment is found only in God, then the good news, Christ follower, is that we already have everything that we need. Access through Jesus to live in the kingdom of God here and now. He is our security, our satisfaction, and significance, and we can rest in that. It means that we can stop worshiping things. We can stop pursuing stuff 
in the hopes that it will somehow silence some script that we've been believing or some desire deep within us. Generosity is worship because it rejects bowing down to things and instead reflects our trust in God. Ultimately, I would say it this way, that it's not wrong to ask God to bless you, but it is wrong to keep it to yourself when he does. It's not wrong to pray, Lord, would you bless me and my family? I pray that for my family every day. It's not wrong to pray that. When the New Testament would say, though, to us, it is wrong to keep it to ourselves when he does. Life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. It is found in being the beloved children of God, and we already possess that through Jesus Christ. May we come to truly and completely understand that that is enough. He is enough. Hey everyone, thank you so much for joining us on our YouTube channel today. I hope that you felt the welcome home of Christ right through your screen. Here we believe that the gospel is good news worth sharing. So if you'd like to share this stream with your friends and family, you can also subscribe to this channel and you can use at BridgeChurchTN. Also, if you'd like to give, there's a link in the description there. You can click and it'll walk you through all the steps. And if you'd like to stay connected with us, you can simply head on over to bridge.tv. Hope to see you again soon.